like to welcome everybody and thank you all for attending um, this uh, lecture uh, provided by or given by Dr. George Kiraz. Uh, this is the first lecture uh, that is being hosted by the Educational Programs Committee uh, under the Archdiocese. We hope that we can continue uh, these kinds of uh, educational lectures on various topics um, on a quarterly basis. So please be on the lookout. If you haven't already done so, we have a clipboard in the back where you can give us your contact information. We will be sending emails and other uh, information for future events. So please uh, make sure you see the uh, back table. Also at the back table, we have um, a plethora of books that are available for sale uh, through the Archdiocese, uh, from the Sunday school level all the way um, up to the most recent book that was put out, uh, The Chronicles of Michael Rabo. If you have a time, if you have a chance to take a look at the books, um, they are uh, over there uh, available for purchase. And in the back uh, left corner, we also have some refreshments and. Um, if anybody would like to help themselves, please do. Um, without further ado, I just, one other thing. We'd like to save all questions and comments uh, for the end. We'd let, let, let George get through all of his si slides and his presentation. If you do have questions, we'll open it up. Uh, if, and then if you can kindly just come up to the front and we'll allow you to, a moment at the microphone so that we can all hear your question and then have George answer it, okay? So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring up Dr. George Kiraz. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you all for coming on this very nice day. So, today's lecture you see the title there, what does it mean to be Syriac Orthodox or what does it mean to be Syrioyo? Unfortunately, I may not have the answer for you. It's a, it's a difficult question and uh, it depends on you also how you want to define it and how you want to, to uh, define yourself. One time, Christine and I were interviewing somebody uh, who wanted to work for us and she had uh, a gap in her CV. Uh, about two years of doing nothing. So one of the questions we were asking was, well, what were you doing, you know, in those two years? So she said, well, I was traveling. I, wa I, was, I was searching for myself. I, I was looking for, for myself. So if I don't answer my question, down to New York Airport, go somewhere for a year, and then maybe you can find yourself. So we will start with a definition of what identity is. And this definition comes from the source of all knowledge, Wikipedia. <laughs> Identity is a person's conception and expression of their own self-identity. Let's see if we can be cool and do things like that. Of their own self-identity and others in individuality or group affiliation such as national identity and cultural identity. So one thing to take from this it is, it is your own conception of who you are. So identity starts with you defining who you are rather than me standing here and telling, telling you who you are. So there is that individual individuality factor. But also you belong to a community and that's why you're sitting here with, with so many other people. So it is not just you on your own, but there is also a component another component and that component uh, puts you together with, with other people. So let's talk a bit about cultural identity because that's really uh, the sort of thing that defines us. So again, Wikipedia, cultural identity is the identity or feeling of belonging to as part of the self-conception and self-perception. Again, it is self, self, self. You know, it's, it is, it is you, it, you have to be happy with who you define yourself to be. And it is your self-perception with regards to many things. Here on this definition, we have a list, nationality, ethnicity, religion, social class, 
generation, like you know, young people like me, old people like you, <laughs> locality, and so on and so forth. So identity is not one word. We're not going to be able to put a label on identity. It, it, it's, uh, it, it has to deal with faith, it has to deal with ethnicity, it has to deal with gender, it has to deal with so many things. So we are going to talk about a few of these things, a few of these items. They are in the table here. And don't worry about this big table. It is on your handout. We will go through it a bit by bit. And the, the thing that I want to uh, stress again is that identity is not just one thing. That's why it's a matrix or it's a table. So if we look at the first row of the table, faith, your faith defines you or defines one element of you. Are you Jewish? Are you Christian? Are you Muslim? Are you Hindu? Are you Buddhist? So that is one element of your identity. So you are... What? Okay. Then we can go on. Okay. So, it's not sufficient. There's so many Christian people out there, right? So, you know, faith to the second degree now. You know, are you Orthodox? Are you Catholic? Are you Protestant? Are you Evangelical? And what are you? You're Orthodox. So to the third degree, what kind of Orthodox? You know, there's Eastern Orthodox, there's Oriental Orthodox, and we will talk about these things. We happen to, be, to belong to a group that is called the Oriental Orthodox. Us, the Armenians, the Copts, we belong to this group. Now, all of this helps in defining who, who you are, helps in making you unique. It makes you different than these other people that we talked about. That is good in the sense that, you know, it, it may make you proud of who you are, learn more about your heritage, and so on and so forth. But you also have to be careful with that. You don't want to define yourself in a little square and put yourself in a bubble, because we live with other people, and we live with other communities. So we also have to be open to others. So although we are Oriental Orthodox, you know, we have to interact with Eastern Orthodox. You go up, up the table. You know, there are other Christian groups. We need to also be open to them and even to other faiths. So it's going to be a balance of making yourself unique, what is so special about my own culture, but at the same time, we want to be part of larger groups. One of these larger groups we're going to talk about is the next one here on, on the table, the Syriac family. So we belong to the Syriac Orthodox Church, but there are other churches, not necessarily Orthodox, that belong to what we call the Syriac family because they use Syriac uh, as the language for their liturgy. And we will talk about that a bit more in other styles. So all of this has to deal with our religion, our faith. But we talked it's a matrix, so it's not only that, not just faith. There is language. You know, do you come from an Aramaic speaking background or family Arabic speaking, Turkish speaking, Malayalam speaking, or English speaking? And there is also elements of culture. You know, some of us who come maybe from Turkey will listen to Turkish music. We eat, you know, maybe with different foods. And those who come from the Arab world, they have, you know, different type of music, different type of culture. And I have the last column about fabness, how fab are you? So, so that is, so, so the thing to get here is that there are so many items to talk about when we talk about identity. And there is also one thing that always comes up, that's, we call it nomenclature, that's the, the label, what do I call myself? And there are some competing terminologies used by the community. We will talk about that too a bit later. So this slide is all the all, all, you know, overview. In Syriac, some people say Soryoyo, some people say Oromoyo, some people say Oturoyo. Or in Arabic, some people say Syriani. In Turkish, some people say Suriani. And when we deal with English, there are terms like Syriac, Syrian, Aramaic, Assyrian, Aramaean. So all of these are labels that that we use to define the community. And also, 
there are folks that you know like to use a combination. I'll use this term for English, but I'll use that term for, for uh, in Suryoyo. So this is the overview, and we will start from the beginnings, and we will go fast. Don't worry. So the beginnings of Christianity. So where do we fit in in terms of the Christian faith? <coughs> Sorry, I'm recovering from a flu. So, you probably all know that Christianity started in kids. Where did it start? It's on the slide. <laughs> all right, so it started in Palestine, yeah? Jesus was there, and the disciples were there, and then it started moving to other places. It reached Antioch, where, according to the Book of Acts, is the place where Christians were first called Christians. Uh, and we are proud that our church is called the Church of Antioch because it is an ancient church. And then it spread to many places in the Middle East. Here is a map of the Middle East. Uh, so you don't see Lebanon and Syria and Turkey and so on and so forth. Why? Because these countries didn't exist at the time. Yeah. So here is under the, Jerusalem will be somewhere here. And here's Antioch. And Edessa is a very important place for the beginnings of Syria Christianity. And most of this area, most, most of this area at that time was Aramaic speaking. And Aramaic at that time was the lingua franca. Who can tell me what a lingua franca is? Kids. What's a lingua franca? Common language. It's the sort of the international language. What's the international language today? English. You don't know English, you're not getting anywhere in this life. Chinese is becoming. During the first centuries of Christianity, Aramaic was the, was the common language. Even if at home you didn't speak Aramaic, you needed to know Aramaic in order to communicate with other people. And the reason Aramaic was the lingua franca, or the common language, is because two empires used it as its official language. The Persian Empire used it as an official language, for example. And that kind of forced everybody, well, if you need to communicate with anybody, you need, you need, to, know, you need to know the language. So we have, during, from that period of time, a rich history, and that's important for our identity, because we want things to be proud of. For example, if we look at this ancient manuscript, this is a book written by hand. It is now in the British Museum. It's from the year 411. That's quite old. Fifth century, yeah? 411. Why do we know it's from 411? The guy who wrote it, he wrote, I wrote this in the year 411. So that makes this book, or this manuscript, it makes it a dated manuscript. That means it's a manuscript that has a date in it. There are many manuscripts without a date. What is so special about this dated manuscript? Correct. It gives us the time, we know the exact time frame when it happened. And this manuscript, from 411 is the oldest manuscript with a date. Oldest. Not only in Suryoyo. This is the oldest manuscript with a date in any language ever known. It's in the British Museum. It used to be in Deir Suryan in Egypt. So there's a rich heritage there. And I have here an astrolabe. Does, does anybody know what an astrolabe is? It's measurements for astronomy. Yeah, for astronomy. So, so there was there was a culture there that didn't produce only literature, but also sciences and philosophy and and mathematics and chemistry. So, Kristen can be happy, and 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 so many other sciences. Now. The beginnings of any faith, or the beginning, even if you, if you were to start an organization, you're going to sit together 
and try to define the goals of this organization. What do you want to do with this organization? The same thing with religions, be it Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism. In the beginning, people are trying to define it. What is it? What do I believe in? So from the beginnings of Christianities, there were people that were having different ideas of how they want to go about doing things, even from the times of the apostles. You know, St. Peter and St. Paul did not see eye to eye. And that's why in the book of Acts, we have the story where they had to hold a synod. They had to meet. They had to get all the other apostles to meet to make a decision because St. Peter wanted to go this way and St. Paul wanted to go that way. And that is why meetings and synods were were held. During the first few centuries of Christianity, some groups have different ideas about Jesus. Is he really God? Is he not God? And so on and so forth. So people used to hold councils. The, the emperor would call the bishops to hold the councils so that they can decide on the faith of the church. And you probably all know about these councils, right? Every Sunday, what do you say in the, in the, in the church? And I, I believe in the three ecumenical councils of... There you go. There is one more council. It's called the Council of Chalcedon. And you don't say it upstairs. Why don't you say it upstairs? Why don't you mention it? Because our church does not conform to that. So in Nicaea, in Constantinople, and in Ephesus, also <coughs> there were people who had different ideas. But the folks who did not agree with Nicaea no longer exist. Same thing with Constantinople, they no longer exist. But at the time of the Council of Chalcedon, the division was much, much bigger. And the two parties opposing each other, or they were strong. So no party became extinct. And it is because of this meeting of 451 that today we have different churches. We're not going to go through why they met and what the arguments were, because I don't understand all of it myself. It's very philosophical and very theological. But the end result was there was a division and different churches came, or groups of churches came about. We are where the arrow is. We belong to the Oriental Orthodox Church. <coughs> the more you go to the this is the what, the right? My right. Is it your right? <laughs> it's your right too. The more you go to the right, the more you stress the oneness of the nature of Christ. It's Christ human and divine. And the more you go this way, the more you stress the separation between these natures. That, that's what the argument was all about. But never mind the argument, we ended up with Oriental Orthodox churches. We have here another group that consists of the other Orthodox churches, like the Greeks, the Russians, the Serbs, and the Catholics as well, they all belong to, to this group, and there is one group called the Assyrian Church of the East. It's one church only. So, in terms of where do we fit in, in this theological spectrum, so to speak, it's where the green arrow is. But as we said, we want to define yourself to be unique and unique and unique, but at the same time we want to be part of a bigger family. So we are part of the Syriac speaking family and we share many things with them. We share a language, a culture, and a heritage, and a common Bible, and we'll talk about these things separately. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we are, that's where we're our churches. There's also a Syriac Catholic Church, and there's a Maronite Church, which is also Catholic. There is a Chaldean Church, which is also Catholic, and there's the Assyrian Church of the East. And in India, there is the Martoma Church. All of these churches, they share something in common. First of all, Syriac is the liturgical language for all of these churches. They have, they share many saints, they share a common history, they share a common heritage, and also 
they share a common Bible. Our Bible, we call it the Peshitta Bible, the simple Bible, and I'll talk, I'll talk about it in, in another slide. So in terms of language, we will start with language. Here's the tree where, where Syriac is. Syriac is a form of Aramaic, and Aramaic is a very ancient language. The oldest, old Aramaic, the oldest uh, phase of Aramaic goes to the 10th century BC. It's probably older. We say 10th century BC because it is the first time we have evidence. There is a stone inscription written on stone from the 10th century BC. So that's why we go, it goes as back as the 10th century BC, but probably before. <coughs> and language develops. Language never stays static, even English. Try to pick an English book written 500, 500 years ago, <coughs> you will have a hard time reading it. So from Old Aramaic, we, we go to Middle Aramaic here, then Late Aramaic and Syriac belongs to this phase. And there are some people who, who still speak today Aramaic. Who speaks Aramaic at home? Turoyo. Raise your hand. So here we go. Where's, where's Turoyo? Turoyo. Central. Central Neo-Aramaic. Turoyo. Yeah? But we share this heritage with these other churches that I mentioned. The churches that of the Syriac tradition who use Syriac in their liturgy. <coughs> we also share with them a history. Here is a mosaic. This is actually a pagan mosaic. We have a lot of mosaics from the area of Urfa, Edessa, uh, from the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd century BC, before most of the people there became Christian. So all these are pagan pagan inscriptions. They're usually on tombs. This is, this is on a tomb. It says, this is my tomb. When I die, put me here. <coughs> but when you're rich, you can make your tomb look like this. And we also talked about sciences, about the Astro Lab, but also there's art. So these are manuscripts with, with art. And the last one here is from the 20th century. This is a book. You'll find it upstairs in the church. It's also written by hand. So I want to illustrate the continuity of this heritage. We're going back from the, I think this one is from the second or the third century, and this is from the 20th century. This is a very long history of continuous use. You know, English may go back to the Middle Ages. <coughs> Other languages, most languages may also go back to the Middle Ages. So we said in, the, in a previous slide that we share with these, lang with these churches language, culture, heritage, and Bible. So I want to say, have one slide on the Bible and the importance of the Syriac Bible. Unfortunately, because we don't treat Syriac, most of us, uh, we can't read the Syriac Bible. So we go to Barnes and & Noble and, and, and we, buy, we buy an English Bible. So what is so special? about the Syriac Bible. One thing is that it preserves many ancient readings. What do I mean by that? The Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Syriac in the first and second centuries. By the end of the second century, the Hebrew Bible was completed uh, and was available in Syriac. Scholars argue was it done by Jewish people as a Targum, because the Jews no longer spoke, uh, spoke Hebrew, and they needed, they needed a Bible in Aramaic, and then it was taken over by the church? Or was it translated by a group of Christian people, or somewhere in between? Scholars exactly still don't know, but it is that old. And we have manuscripts, of course we don't have anything from the the first copy from the 1st, 2nd, or 3rd century, but we have physical manuscripts in museums and in libraries from the 5th century. So that is really old. If you think of the Hebrew Bible, you know, it's a translation from Hebrew, but the original Hebrew, if you think that the oldest manuscripts 
that are available are from the Middle Ages. Well, it's very important to have something from the 5th century that gives you an earlier snapshot of, <coughs> of that text, even though it is a translation. Another thing that is special about the Syriac Bible, or at least the Syriac heritage, our church fathers, when they wrote commentary on the Bible, when they explained the Bible, they, all, they always looked at the text of the Bible as allegorical. Who knows what that means, allegorical? Hmm? Pardon? Like imagery, there are symbols behind it. So they never, they never looked at it literally. And St. Ephraim wrote a commentary on the Bible in the 4th century, 5th century, 5th century. Um, in the introduction, he, he didn't write it on, on the whole thing, on, on number of books in the Bible. And he started with this, he said, well, many people before me wrote commentaries on the Bible. So why am I writing one? If there is only one meaning to the words of the Bible, there is no need for me to write a commentary. But because there is imagery and symbolism, and each person can interpret it with freedom, I am writing my own opinion of what I think the words of the Bible mean. Another thing that is special about the Bible, it contains things that don't exist in other Bibles. There is a book in the Old Testament called Second Baruch. Go try to find it in your Bible. You're not going to find it. It's lost in Hebrew, I think. It only exists in the Surya Bible. When did you hear us upstairs reading Revelation? Did anybody hear us in the church reading Revelation? Why is that? Revelation was never part of the official Syriac Bible, of the Pshitta Bible. And in fact, there are very late translations into Syriac of Revelation, 6th, 7th century, maybe. But very few copies exist. So, and it was only discovered in the 19th century, these copies were only discovered in the 19th century. Our folks in our monasteries never knew that text. Of course, we'll say, well, why is it missing from the Bible? You know, you have to think of, remember, the reason the Bible is one book in, your, in our head now is because we go and we buy it from Barnes & Noble in one book. But once you open it, you know it is many books. So when, pe when our scribes and our monks wrote the Bibles, they never wrote the whole thing. Either they wrote you know, one book, five books, the Gospels, maybe the epistles together. Uh, so they wrote parts of them. Yeah. So, so that's what makes our Bible unique. And it has something to do with our identity because it is our Bible. So we have a project to translate it into English so that people can read it. But unfortunately, most of it is in Syriac and we can't really access it unless we know Syriac. So we talked about faith, about the church, about the language, about history, what makes us unique, the things that we share with other people. So what identifies you as Surioyo? Apart from I'm a Christian and I am Surioyo. So for example, when you come to the church, there are things that we do here that are different from other churches. You come to our weddings and you have all this uh, crowning and so on and so forth that you may not see somewhere else. You go to Passion Week and we have the Sogdin al Laslibo. Do you know it? Sing. See, every, there you go. That's part of your identity. Your friend at school doesn't know it, right? <laughs> That's what makes you who you are. 
I, I was in Cambridge doing my, my graduate studies and I've always gone to church, always I went to church and I wanted to go to church too. So I went to the college chapel, and it's very nice, it's Anglican, Episcopalian here we would call it. So I went to church and you know what, it's just different, nothing wrong with it. It's a nice church, beautiful church, beautiful music. You know, I'm like, heck with this. <laughs> you know, I went once, I went twice, and then that's it. You know, it's, it, you know, I'm sure if I grew up there, it would be great. It depends, you know, how you grew up. So I started going to London. We have a Surya church, but it was far. Our Sayyidna was, was a monk. He was, the, he was the priest there. I used to go maybe once every, every two to three months. But, you know, this is what... What makes you Surioyo? With the language. How many of you know Abun Bashmayo here? Great. And I bet you, I bet you, I bet you, most of you, if I give you a phrase in the middle of Abun Bashmayo, you cannot tell me what it means. Yet you know it. Yet you know it. One time we were in a park, and I think it was your kids. They came shlomoing our kids. <laughs> shlomo, shlomo. I'm like, who are these kids? I think they knew each other from the camp. It's the shlomo that, you know, gives you a sense of, of identity, of, of who you are. And of course, it doesn't mean that we don't have except the others. It <coughs> Kenora is ready to sleep. <laughs> <coughs> we always have to remember this balance. We want to know things about our culture so that we are proud of it, but also we always have to be accepting of other communities and people outside. And being Suryoyo, you know, you could be from India and Suryoyo. You know, maybe not ethnically, you know, we're not going to dance to Indian music and they're not going to dance to your music. But there is that what, what you, know, you share together. You know, you're not more Surioyo than Dr. Gretchen, dear. She's as much of a Surioyo as you are. It is this belonging to this, this community that makes you Surioyo. Again, one more thing. What do you say to Abuna when you see him? Who says that? Right? Who says that? In the morning you say Barakh more, in the evening you say Barakh more. You know, nobody says that. I, I, I have a story. There was an old man uh, in Bethlehem. I was a little kid. He told me the story. Um, he, I think he was a shoemaker. And, and every time a priest passes, he says Barakh more. And then a non Suryoyo priest pa passed, uh, Rome Orthodox. Uh, and, and he would t say Barakh more. And then the priest one day stopped and he said, you know, what is this? You keep telling me Barakh more. He said, well, when we see a priest, to re you know, because we respect the priest, we say Barakh more, we don't say good morning, good evening. And he says, what does it mean? He says, bless my Lord, bless me. So, so the room priest, he goes, great. Never say anything else to me. Just say Barakh more to me. I like it so much. <laughs> so this is, again, <coughs> part, part of <coughs> this culture. Many people come with the question of the label. What do we call ourselves? <coughs> and this has become a contentious issue. You know, we're all familiar with the term Suryoyo, but there are other terms as well. There are people who, in Syriac, so the bold, the bold is the language that, that this word is in. You know, instead of Suryoyo, they like to use Oromoyo, or they like to use Othuroyo. In Arabic, there is Suryani, in Turkish also, uh, Syriani, in Turkish Suryani. And in, in English, there are all these words that I listed. <coughs> Remember what I told you in the beginning. Your self-identity is your self-identity. What you're comfortable with is what you are comfortable with. 
All of these things are labels. It's like a book and it's like the cover of the book. It's not the meat, it's not what's in the book. The meat is you. The, the, the essence is you, no matter what, what label you use. And I can't tell you what to use. I'll use what I use, and you can do whatever you want. I have this, this uh, very funny post from Facebook. I saw it a few, 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 other, other, uh, few days ago. So once somebody wants, I speak Syriac or Aramaic, and there's so many terms. So he constructed this very, very long phrase. <coughs> so I think to resolve this this issue when it comes to when when you see people who feel so strongly about something, the best thing is maybe just let them be. Because if you don't let them be, you start you know causing argumentations. It's like Republicans and Democrats, you know, sometimes the Republicans want to do something just because the Democrats are not doing it, or the other way around. The Democrats, they want to do it just because the Republicans don't want to do it. <coughs> so, the message is to find your own way for your own cultural identity. So, how are you going to do that? I'm not going to sit here all, all day long and every day and talk, right? So where can you find more information about your own heritage, your culture, so you can learn more about it? Church? In books. Reading is very, 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 very important. And sometimes I hear it a lot. We don't know much about our heritage. It's, not, it's as if there is not a single book written on Syriac. Just go to Amazon.com and type Syriac. And you'll see the, the, the amount of books that are there. I listed a few ones for you. One book is back there, The, the Hidden Pearl. Most of you maybe have it at home. It's three big volumes. You know, it's, it's not a novel. If you want to learn a bit about your heritage, it's, it's not... You know, it, it's not fiction. So you've got to, you know, get yourself to read this stuff if you want to read more. If you're interested about the Syriac Bible, there's a great book by Sebastian Brock, The Bible in the Syriac Tradition. It tells you what's unique about the Syriac Bible. What's different between the Syriac Bible and the other Bibles that, that you know. And there is a good online resource, Syriac Orthodox Resources, it has a lot of information, especially about our, our own, own church, about deacons and history of the church and, 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 and very, various things. So, uh, so you don't need George Kiraz. You can, you can read. So. so there you go. Go and find the books. <laughs> I've been babbling for 45 minutes, so now maybe you can talk if you have any questions or if you want to comment. If you have any questions, please come up to the podium so we can all hear you. Yeah. Is it for the church or for I mean, we put it there, it said, they said you are not allowed to put it there. But is it for the church only? Do you have it with you? Yes, I have. The blue one. No, no, the brown one that you wrote. You wrote it. No, 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 no. I am talking about a book, it's blue. It's called The, the Bible in the Syriac Tradition. Oh, no. By Sebastian Brock. The one you have, we have here. I looked at it, it's nice. Why don't we let it be available for people to read? Why do we keep it there? I bring some, and you'll see. I mean, I think it's gonna shed a good highlight on the serial. Yeah, yeah. Bring it. I don't know which one you're talking about. Are there any questions? Come on up here. Georgie. 
<laughs> so to be Christian, you have to love, right? Yeah. So do you <laughs> do you love the devil? Do I love the devil? Do Christians love the devil if they have to love? <laughs> I told you not to be jealous. <laughs> I will speak in Arabic. It's better to me. <laughs> okay. طبعا هذا السؤال ما أول مرة يسأل من طفل. هذا السؤال سأله طفل للمرحوم البطرق زكا. قالوا سيدنا. دائما نقول لازم نحب عدونا طيب نحن المسيحيين لازم نحب الشيطان سؤال صعب وفي نفس الوقت سهل طبعا الشيطان هو ليس عدونا نحن هو عدو الله الشيطان مشكلته ما هي مع الإنسان مشكلته مع الله والله أكيد يحب الشيطان ما يكرهه ولكن نحن لازم نكره الشيطان لأنه أعماله ما هي ضدنا أنا الرب أوصاني أحب قريبي كنفسي أما الشيطان أعماله موجهة ضد الله مباشرة فما لازم أحبه في شارة تانية ملفون وجورج حكى أنه الشيء اللي يميزنا السريان هو السرياني مثل أبو مبشمايو بارخمور في قصة تضحك على هاي صارت مع سيدنا متى شمعون إذا تعرفوه كان سكرتير البطرك يعقوب ببيروت وقت اللي كان مطران فقاعدين بنهار من هال من الأيام بالمطرانية إجا واحد بده مساعدة قال لن أنا سرياني فالراهب متى يعرف أنه هذا منه سرياني فقام قال له تعرف أبو مبشمايو قال له أبونا جارنا هو <تصفيق> جيراننا فعرف رأسا أنه هذا منه سرياني لأنه لو يعرف من هو أبو مبشمايو ما يقول جيراننا <تصفيق> ميرسي شكرا You got it, Georgie? So because... So Abuna said that uh, the same question was asked to Patriarch, Patriarch of, uh, uh, Zakka. And the answer was, Jesus told us to love our, our own enemies, so we should love our own enemies. But, but Satan, or the devil, is the enemy of God. And because he's not our own enemy, you should not love him because he's the enemy of God. Got it? This is turning into theology. Uh, well, I mean, as Christians, we are supposed to love our own enemies, no matter who you, who they are, right? So nobody can sanction not to love them. Yeah. Because any enemy may repent one day and yeah. become Christian. I mean, the devil will never repent. That's why. Can, can that be written in the, in the, in the, in the Bible? What's in the Bible? Written in a book according to the church tradition. 
Is, is it written in a book that you should... It's already in the Bible. It's already in the Bible. Can it be added, you mean? Well, you, we can't add things to the Bible. I mean, if somebody writes an introduction, you know, I mean, this is a... The one that, that Faith's talking about is the... Can I open one? This is the project I talked about where we're translating the, the Suryoyo Bible into English. So this is the book of Matthew. Is it Matthew? This is Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew in, in Suryoyo and in English. So my job is to, to edit the, the Suryoyo. Now, in the introduction, I can write whatever I want. I have an introduction here. with my name and I can say whatever I want but the actual text you know the text is we look at it it's you know believe it or not it's not easy to come up with the text because we we have to look at many manuscripts to make sure that because manuscripts differ from each other people copy and make mistakes and and so you have to make sure that you know you're you're putting a reliable text and sometimes Sometimes we like to change something in the sense that, you know, I want to change this word from being written this way to that way because I think it is easier for you to understand it that way. But I can't just go and change it without evidence. I have to find manuscripts that have the form of the word, the spelling of the word that I want to give you so that so, so, so that I know it exists in these manuscripts. Because, you know, spelling changes from time to time and from generation to generation, spelling changes sometimes. But even with spelling, when we want to change spelling, you know, for example, the, you know, the, the, the ladies, <coughs> the women, after they went to the tomb of Jesus, they went to see the, they went to the disciples to tell them and went in Suryoyo is what? Ezel, right? Yeah, Ezel. Now we wanted to add a youth at the end to say it's feminine and put Siome on it. And in all old manuscripts, we don't have that because in early Syriac, there was no youth in Siome. Ezel, he went and they, females, they went, is the same word. But because language, language evolved and spelling changed, we wanted to change it. But even then, we have to find late manuscripts, at least, that have that spelling. So the actual text of the Bible, it's... Uh, nobody gave me permission to change it. <laughs> yeah. I'll ask a question, that's okay. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I need to ask anybody. Okay. Yes. Hi, how are you guys? Um, first of all, thank you. Awesome job. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, God bless. And I just want to, I know that we're working on translating the Suryoya Bible to English. I just wanted to ask if it will include the book of Revelation. <laughs> yes, we're doing all of it. We are adding the book of Revelation. But there will be in the introduction a note to people so that they know. Um, this is, this is a special edition we did for the camp, but the, the title of the series, it's called the Syriac Pshitta Bible. And then each volume, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Genesis, whatever. The book of Revelation just says the Syriac Bible, doesn't say the Syriac Pshitta Bible, because I can't say it's part of the Pshitta, it was never part of the Pshitta. But, but it, is, it is there. Even though, uh, I don't think we have it in Matthew, in Luke, there are two verses that are not in the Syriac. So we are giving those uh, in translation, but they will be in the footnote in smaller print to indicate that it's not really part of the original text. Um, 
the only exception is the book of Judith from chapter half of chapter 10 going forward it will not be provided because it doesn't exist in Syriac and I cannot I cannot create it it just doesn't exist that's Judith from the Old Testament that's the only exception that won't be there hmm? what do you mean it doesn't it was it it was it was never translated in, into Syriac. You said only half of it. Yeah, half from half of chapter ten till the end. Yeah. And I, I some of these books don't even exist in Hebrew. They exist in Greek translation from the Hebrew, but the Hebrew was lost. Not all of the books were accepted as part of the canon or part of the holy scriptures by by the Jewish communities and again even in Christianity not all of the books are accepted by by everybody for example the revelation is not accepted by our church so so that's why you have missing things the Ethiopians have a book I can't remember what it's called the book of is it Jubilee or the Ethiopians have a book that nobody else has and it comes from Hebrew. It comes from Hebrew. It's just that nobody else has it. And the Coptic, they have one psalm. The Copts have, 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 have an additional psalm, right? And we have how many psalms at the end? We have, we have, I can't remember. There, there's a bunch of psalms at the end that we have that are not in all Bibles. Part of what uh, makes up our cultural identity is also our beliefs in what we commonly they call the social issues. For example, the death penalty, abortion, and so forth. Are those matters of conscience, insofar as our identity and culture is concerned, or is there a set of beliefs that this is what we are? What we as Syria people believe or should not believe, except or not accept. Yeah, all of all of these modern issues are a matter of, of self conscience There isn't, there there isn't any. Uh, well, there, there 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 isn't much in history about it because these are modern issues. Uh, but there are uh, a number of issues that the church or the patriarchs gave rulings on. And once they do that, that kind of becomes the official line. But these are not matters of doctrine. You know, they can change. You know, a patriarch may come, or a synod even, may, came, may make a ruling, let's say, on the death penalty. And 50 years later, they may change that ruling. Because that's, that's not a, this is not a matter of the essence of the faith. You know, the synod cannot go and change things when it comes to matter of faith, on, of, of Christianity itself, of Jesus, you know, who came down for us, and, you know, according to the creed. They cannot make such, such rulings. They can change the fast. They do that. They change the fast. And th th these are <coughs> matters that can be, you know. But the, the, the issues you're talking about, it's really a self-conscience. You as an individual, you know, the, the church may have guidelines. You know, the, 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 the church, for example, uh, prohibits uh, abortion uh, unless, uh, in some circumstances, it allows it. So it's not a total, uh, a total uh, prohibition <coughs> on abortion. But, but these are issues that the church can change if, they, if it wants to change. As for me, I believe that I belong to the church. My country and my nation now is the church. I identify, I identify myself with the Soyoy in, in Canada, in America, in Europe, in the Middle East, under the auspices of Soyoy Church. I mean, so when my, my church said we are Syriac Orthodox, that's what we should yeah. be. 
So we cannot change the sun, can we? Well, I, I, I totally agree with you, and that's how I, I look at it myself. That, that's the label the church gives itself, and I belong to this church, and I'm happy with this label, and, and, and I'm happy with it, and I totally agree with you. But there are people, for whatever reason, they're looking for more than a church. And, and that starts creating issues within the church. You know? I mean, you know, my... My, I mean, I'm not much of a nationalist myself, but there are nationalists out there that they want more, and it becomes an important issue for them. One time, I, I remember I went to, I was invited by Leiden University in Holland to give a talk on identity. Uh, so it was something similar like this, but it was it was more academic, and and there was there were some people there from the community, from one group. I'm not going to mention the groups. And I was talking to them that, uh, you know, you have to work with, with each other. You know, especially you've got the Oromoyo group and the Othoroyo group. And, you know, you've got to work together rather than always, you know, bicker and, 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 and fight with, with each other. And one of them told me uh, my identity and what he meant by identity is label is this word label on the top. And that's what he meant when, 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 when he was talking about identity. So my label, that, that is my name, the name that he, he wanted to use, he goes, it's my life, without it, I'm dead. What can you say? You know, it's important to some people. If it's important, it's important. What are you gonna do? Syrian and Syriac under mm -hmm. the same. When it comes to this one. Right here. Yes. Yeah. English, Syrian, English. Syriac, Arabic, yeah. Assyrian. Yeah. Is there a difference between the Assyrian and the Syrian? So I've heard such conflicting things, but I really am not sure about you know where we differ. Yeah. So um it, it's also not a clear cut. I mean, that this is the, the problem. This is why I, I, I group them under languages. It's not a, a, a uh, clear cut. And I'll, I'll give you an, another example, a conversation I was having with, with somebody in England who preferred in English to use the term, the term Assyrian. And if you were to do a kind of word-for-word -word translation, the word Assyrian would correspond in Syriac as Othoroyo. That, that's the one on the, I should get my pen back. Mm -hmm. These, the kind of, it's kind of a translation of it, loosely speaking. And, but that person, he said, I will never ever call myself Othoroyo, I call myself Suryoyo, but in English I call myself Assyrian. So, that's why it's not a clear cut, because because to some people, uh, you know, although linguistically you may say, okay, well, the term means this, but to some people, you know, it means that. Uh, in the United States, see, see, language, language also evolves, and meanings of words change. So take the word Syriani in Arabic. Okay. If you were to look at writings from the Middle Ages, written in Arabic, and will say, he is Syriani. It didn't mean that he belonged to the Syriani church. Suri. It didn't even mean he is Suri. It could mean that he was Mandian, Sabi'a, because they speak Aramaic. The word Syriani in the middle, in Arabic, in Arabic, in the Middle Ages, it just meant anybody who spoke what we now call scholars, what we now call Aramaic. You know, Aramaic is a bigger umbrella than Syriac. But in the Middle Ages, Syriani was the bigger umbrella. But now, even in Arabic, if you say Syriani, you don't mean a Mandian. If you say Syriani, it doesn't mean 
a Muslim in Syria who speaks Aramaic. There are two villages near Ma'lula who speak Aramaic and it's total Muslim uh, population. So in the Middle Ages, they would have called them Syrian. But today you wouldn't call them Syrian. You would only call somebody Syriani who belonged to the Syrian Orthodox. Even, even somebody from the Assyrian church or the Chaldean church, you wouldn't call them Syrian. You would, today, you would use that term in Arabic only to people from either the Syriac Orthodox Church or the Syriac Catholic Church. If you push it, push it, you may use it to the Maronites. But the Maronites, only at higher ecclesiastical level, they would say we are al Kanisa Suriania al Maronia. But only at that level, you now go to a Maronite, yeah. Now but now you go to, even now you go to, in Lebanon, to somebody in the street. He's not going to say, I'm Syrian, he's going to say, I am Maroni. So, 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 you know, the, the name throughout time changes its meaning. In the United, let's not go too far. In the United States, our church used this label, Assyrian, in the United States. In the 1890s, 1910s, 1920s. If you said, I am Syrian Orthodox in, the 19, in 1910, 1920, it meant that you are Rum, Rum Orthodox. That's what it meant. Because the Rum Orthodox Church in this area, now it's called the Antiochian Church. It wasn't called the Antiochian Church. The Arti you know, Antiochian Diocese, they come sometimes here <coughs> to visit us. <coughs> During that time, it, it was called the Syrian Orthodox Church. Why Syrian Orthodox? They came from Lebanon and Syria. It was still Ottoman times. There was no Syria, no Lebanon. They came here, there was a Greek Orthodox Church. Greek people from Greece. They didn't want to be called the same. So the thing with identity, sometimes what makes you use a term is because you don't want to be like somebody else. So they came here, and there were Greek people, the Greek Orthodox Church. So they said, well, we come from Syria, and we're Orthodox. So we're going to call themselves the Syrian Orthodox Church, the Rome Orthodox. And until this day, until this day, there are some churches in the Midwest. They are still called, there is a St. George Syrian Orthodox Church. It is Rome Orthodox. The... Uh, Secretary of Energy under Clinton, what was his name? Do you know Faye? Christine? The Secretary of Energy under Clinton. Uh, what, Robert something? I can't remember. He, he said, I am Syrian Orthodox. He, I mean... No, no, not so, no, no. I forgot his name. No, 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 not Shaheen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he, he would say, I am Syrian Orthodox, meaning, meaning room. And when we started the, the Syriac Orthodox Resources website in the, in the 90s, I think it was, we used to get email from people asking about their heritage, we are Syrian Orthodox. And then from their questions, I realized, you know, they're not. But that, that's what they used to call themselves. So when our folks came during that time, you know, you, you couldn't be Syrian Orthodox because it was something else. So Paramos, that's why Paramos until this day is called that. And that's why, you know, uh, Rhode Island used to be and, and uh, Boston, Worcester used, used to be. And they changed the Rome Orthodox, you know, when, when, when Syria became Syria and Lebanon became Syria. And most of these people are really from Lebanon, but it was all Syria at the time. When they became distinct countries, they don't want to be called Syriac Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox. So they started calling their church the Antiochian Church. And Bishop Samuel started moving the church in our, our name to, to, to Syrian Orthodox. So that's why it's, it's really difficult to, to say, well, this one corresponds exactly to that one. Because in people, and what defines the word is what's in people's mind. I mean, that's what linguists tell you. You know, there's, there's no truthness to, you know, if 90% if of the population comes and says, this is a table, khalas, this is going to become a table. If 90% of the population is going to call the church a, ta church a table, it's going to become a table. 
George, it was Spencer Abraham, sorry. Spencer Abraham. Spencer Abraham under Bush, not Clinton. Ah, uh, under Bush. Yeah, he was, he was Secretary yeah. of Energy in 2001. Yeah, Spencer Abraham. Yeah. For the benefit of the youth, which are now probably very confused by all this, <laughs> so maybe we bring it to today's uh, age a little bit. So a couple of things, so we pull it together for them. I know you're trying to be very kind of open and accommodating to everybody self-identifying, but let's help them a little bit. So the church was recently changed here from Syrian Orthodox mm -hmm. to Syriac Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. which is what most of the churches now label themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could speak about that for a couple of minutes. Yeah. And for the benefit of the youth, maybe you could distinguish a little bit more why we call ourselves Syriac Orthodox, which is purely religious, and then all the other things with the flags and colors and all these other things that are going on, which absolutely have no religious uh, significant, significance, and they are more political aspirations. Mm -hmm. That might help them a little bit to pull together a lot of information that is put together. So the question is about these two terms here, Syriac and Syria. Um, people who wrote in English, so that doesn't mean us, right? So, people who wrote about us in English in the 1800s, they used these terms Syriac and Syrian. They used the term Syriac more as an adjective. So, they would say the Syriac language, the Syriac church, the Syriac heritage. But when they wanted to call people, they used this term Syrian. And I knew the question was coming up, so I did some research and I even asked some, some people about it, some, some scholars about it. And the C of Syriac probably is a leftover from Latin through French that came into English. And if people in the 1800s use Syriacs, to call the people, it will have been Syriacs now. It's just a choice of word. Uh, unfortunately, English doesn't have a suffix ending, a common ending, to call people that come from a place. So, you know, somebody from New Jersey, what, what are they? New Jersey. Yeah, well, and what's somebody from New York? And why is it New Yorker and not, you know, well, why are you not in New Jersey? Unfortunately, English doesn't have that. And there are about a set of about 10 suffixes that you can use in English. And it just ends up being a matter of usage, a matter of habit. Yeah? The reason, the reason uh, we here, to answer the question and for the youth, we wanted the name to be unique. Sayyidna wanted the name to be unique so it doesn't get confused with, you know, Syrian as in other usages. Uh, so he asked the Synod if we can use, you know, use that as, as the official name. Yeah, it just more, it makes you more unique. There's no confusion. When you say Syrian, you know, there is confusion. You could be, you know, an Arab from Syria. You could be a Christian, a Jewish, a Muslim. It could be anything. When you say Syriac, it's very clear. There is no confusion. And it just, for that... <coughs> for that purpose. So it's not a matter of accuracy, it's a matter it's a matter of of usage. And the other point one second doctor if I can add something. So when when it got changed to Syriac Orthodox, it cleared up this, you know, where did you come from question. So if you were Syrian Orthodox, most of the most of the follow up you would get from people, oh you're from Syria. So this was one of the big drivers in changing it to Syriac Orthodox Church. So if you see any older books and you see Syrian Orthodox, and if you see something today like a letterhead or websites or things like that, you're going to see Syriac Orthodox. And you no longer get the question, are you from Syria? You now get, what is Syriac? Or if they know what it is, say, oh, you speak Syriac. So there was a direct association with more of a language than where you came from. Just to be, and that happened, I don't know exactly when the change was, but it was in the 90s. Nine, 90s, is it change? I can tell you that the, the, official, the official name was changed in January of 2014. In, 
in the state of New Jersey where we are incorporated. So it now became the Archdiocese of the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch in the Eastern United States. Now, what we've been trying to do since then is have all the changes, all the churches slowly change their names as well. Most of the churches are still known as the Syrian Orthodox Church. We like them, and because churches are all over the place, every church is incorporated in a separate, in a different state. We need to have them change it in their incorporation documents so that it, every church now becomes Syriac and take out Syria. Mm -hmm. So, Doctor, part two now. Part two. Flags and colors. Flags and colors. And, and birds and <laughs> and, and It's very creative. It all depends on you know what gives you a kick. Uh, Does this have anything to do with the church religion? No, these things these things are they're part of the cultural heritage. It's people tr trying to find an identity that is not purely religious, an identity that is more on the national, uh, that has a na national aspiration. And, and that's, where, that's where flags and anthems and that sort of thing, you know, come about. Uh, come about. Th this is something, of course, that is modern. Uh, the whole idea of nationalism is a 19th century European idea. Before that, nobody knew what nationalism is. And a bit by bit, uh, the idea of nationalism started to, to spread, and of course it arrived to the Middle East. And in the late 1800s, some people from all communities, they started thinking along those lines. I mean, all communities in the Middle East, their affiliation was religious, be it Christian or non-Christian. You know, if you're a Muslim, you are either a Sunni or a Shia, or even within Sunnism or Shiism, <coughs> within this group or that group, and there was also a tribal affiliation. That was people's affiliations. You know, the, the, the idea of, of, a, of a nation and borders and state you know, the 1800s is, is, is an age of empires. The whole world was the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, the, 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 the French, the German, four or five, and that's it, they ruled the entire world. It was, it was a world of empires. So people did, did, didn't even, you know, you can't even say, well, what was the nationality of our, of St. Ephraim? It didn't exist, yeah? So, so now there are some people that, want to look beyond the church and that's where you know flags and anthems and 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 all sorts of things come about in the greek language they said about saint afrin they said afrin to seal the syrian yeah. the syrian yes afrin the syrian yeah. but one thing that's a very good point saint afrin and you may see it in many books. I thought you go read books, so you, you'll find it. It's always Ephraim the Syrian. But why Ephraim the Syrian? Why not Saint Jacob Bordono the Syrian? Why not Michael Rabo? Why not? It's because Saint Ephraim, his writings were translated into Greek. So it's the Greek people who would say, oh, it's St. Ephraim, it's Ephraim, that guy, the Syrian guy, the guy from Syria. And that's why only St. Ephraim, Isaac of Nineveh, these are the, the only two that I can think of that they have the label Syrian attached to their name because their writings were known outside of the region in Greece. And, you know, to identify them, you know, uh, if, if we were sitting here 100 years ago, Gretchen is going to be known as Gretchen the American. That would be her last name probably. Because that's how people identified things about 100 years ago. So it's the same thing with St. Ephraim. His writings are in Greece, in Greek. So the Greek people said, oh, this is the writing of Ephraim. Not this Ephraim that we know from here, Ephraim the Syrian, that guy. So the name is on post from outside. 
Every time you, you introduce something new, sometimes people introduce something new in, in, with, with, a, with a good intention, they, they, with, so that the problem is resolved. But of course, it, a problem is never resolved. It's, it's, you're, you're just uh, defragmenting more, uh, more and more and, and, and creating you know, more and more labels. You know, there are proposals. There's some people say, okay, well, let's find a solution. Let, let's say a Syriac. You know, I mean, you can come up with two billion proposals, you know, and if, if, if it goes, you know, it, 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 it will, you, you will, as you said, you will always, you know, leave people behind. Um, you know, in the year 2000, you know, every year we have a census here in, in, in the US. And in the year 2000, there was a proposal, because the, the record on the Census Bureau was Assyrian from those times I mentioned in the early times. So there was a proposal uh, to change it, but then to change it to what? So there was a proposal to change it to Assyrian slash Chaldean slash Syriac. So anybody that puts any of these three can be lumped in that category in the Census Bureau. And the intention was, was, was good because the intention was, you know, the more people that can be categorized, if you have enough number categorized under that category, then, you know, you, you can start to have minority rights. Because you won't have minority rights unless, uh, it's funny, when you're a minority, you, you have to be a majority of a minority to have, to have some rights. You know, you can't have rights if, 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 if you're only 50,000 people, you know, and Washington DC is not going to give you anything. So that was the intention of, of, of that report. Not that you should call yourself a Syrian slash Chaldean slash Syriac. It's just that whatever you choose from these, it will be lumped in the Census Bureau under that category. And there was a big hoopla about it. And people went crazy in the year 2000 uh, on, on the internet for it and against it and for it. It just went, went crazy. <coughs> so that's why belonging to the church is better. It's always there. <laughs> That's what it's they not say. <laughs> uh, John uh, mentioned that very sensitive issue and is absolutely right. You likened it to uh, being of loyalty or loyal. For some reason, they have animosity, clash, or whatever you want. You liken it to Democrats and Republicans. And we know all of us, as if they all work for the same church, we belong to the same church. These are political aspirations, as John said. Now, do you do you think you got these type of ethnic identities, our church, and really maintain its strength? Being considering we came from a, a Muslim or non-Christian dominated uh, population to a Christian dominated population, uh, would that have any effect? Everything has pros and cons. You know, nothing is good, 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 and bad, bad, bad. You cannot deny that the folks that concentrated on either ethnicity or nationality and so on and so forth, you cannot deny that they have contributed so much to 20th century culture. Starting from the 1890s, folks, folks like Naum Fire, for example, they started, you know, I mean, you'll be surprised to know that here in the US, in the 1910s, we used to have newspapers. 1910s. And of course, these, these were not driven, uh, they, they were driven by you know, people who are motivated nationally, like Naum Fire, for example, who was a Shamosho Evangeloyo at the same time. Many people could balance this. Many people can, can balance it. They can have this and they can have that, and that's very healthy if you can, if you can balance it. <coughs> of course, there was a lot of advancement 
in language, in magazines, in culture, in, in, in music, and you know, you cannot, you cannot deny that. Uh, so, so it's not, it's not as, it, it's not that you don't need that. I think the message that I would like to, to give across is, is that groups who have these aspirations, they need to work together. You know, you can't, you know, we have two groups, for example, the Othoroye and the Oromoye, and, you know, they're, they're always bickering with each other. I wish, I wish that there was, that there was a, um, a mission statement that they're bickering about. <laughs> I wish that there was something so that you could, you know, you know, I mean, bickering about a label, to me, is, is, uh, doesn't take you anywhere. You know, so if, 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 if it is just a label, as I have it on this slide, you know, why can't we just, you know, go on with it and, and, and have people, you know, respect each other, respect the other, and do projects together and cooperate and do things together, right? Is this bickering, I'm sorry, just follow up question. No. <laughs> is this bickering that you mentioned, is it a recent phenomenon? I, <coughs> this bickering... People are, are going to love me if you put this online. The, the, the strength of this bickering is a product of Sweden. I love you people in Sweden online. In the 1970s, in the 1970s, uh, two factions in Sweden, and still there are two factions now in Sweden, they were bickering with each other to, 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 to a degree of madness. And that was local. That was, that was local to, to, to Sweden for, for most of the time. And in the 80s, it began to spread uh, to other European countries. And now, thanks to the internet, it's easy. It just, you know, just, just goes wild. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, but the, the, uh, and, and, you, you know, when, when you have two groups bickering, there's always something behind it. It's never the label. There is always something behind it. And if you were to study the social fabric of the people in Sweden and who was in that group and who was in the other group, it really started, it started village against city. It was, it, it was the, 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 the folks of the cities, Midyat, for example, against the folks of the villages of Turabdin. That's how, how it began. Of course, it doesn't mean it didn't have antecedents. I mean, these names are from the 1890s. You see them. But I'm talking about this modern bickering that, that, that we, say to, we see today. It really goes back to the, to the, to the 1970s. Thank you, Sweden. <laughs> Doctor, I just want to say one thing for the youth, just to close this up for them. So when you're looking for a logo, you're looking for a color, you're looking for something fancy, you pick a cross, that's our official logo. You don't worry about anything else. So anything you see that's church-related, that's religious, it's just a cross, and it's the Syriac Orthodox Church. All these other things that you see in other places, those are all secondary. They are outside of the church, and they're more political aspirations and self-identity and all these kinds of things that Dr. talked about.